Lawyers of Reddit, what case still keeps you up at night? This was back when I was interning as a prosecutor. There are a lot of stories that keep me up from that time, but this one has a happy ending. I can't go too much into detail without breaking the laws of my state, but can give you the gist. There were three siblings who decided to jack a car. The plan was, the two sisters would pick up a guy and have him drive to a very bad part of town for a promised threesome. When he got there, the brother would drag him out of the car and beat him enough to render him not a threat, then all three would drive off. The sisters found their mark and things went as planned, but like a lot of criminals, they didn't think too far ahead. The victim had both sisters' cell phone numbers. Cops caught up to them quick at their house, but didn't know who the man was who did the beating. To protect their brother and cut their own sentences, the sisters pointed the finger at John, a man down the street who is a dead ringer for their brother. John gets arrested in short order and is charged with assault with intent to commit murder on account of how bad the beating was. About a year later, I get handed John's jail tape and instructed to listen to them for evidence. Everything you say on a jailhouse phone is recorded. Never talk about your case. The prosecution is going after him hard. They've flipped both of the sisters and a young gun prosecutor with a political future and a good heart for the record is angling for the maximum sentence. Like a lot of defendants, John is making do with an overworked public defender of dubious competence. I listen to all 30 plus hours of tape. The only person who calls John is his grandmother who raised him. The more I listen to the tapes, the more I realize this guy's innocent. He can't name the sisters, his nominal co-defendants, and obviously doesn't know the facts of his case as his grandmother has to relay them to him. I take all of this to the prosecutor and she doesn't believe him. She correctly states that she's heard it all before, and given that she's been doing this for a while, I couldn't blame her for being suspicious and jaded. I pressed the matter, but it was made clear to me that her mind was made up, so I finished the tapes but included my findings and thought about John's innocence on the deliverable. At this point, it was time to go back to school, and I left thinking that an innocent man was going to prison and I couldn't stop it. About a month later, I get a call from a prosecutor. It was short, but she was apologetic. I listened to the tapes you told me to Louris and you were right. We re-questioned the sisters and they admitted it. We're dropping all charges against John and he's getting out of jail today. I'm proud I helped with that in my own small way. What keeps me up at night is that the prosecutors are overworked too and don't usually have time to listen to the jail tapes. If not for an open-minded intern with free time, John would be doing 20 plus years up north right now for a crime he didn't commit. I could never be a prosecutor after that experience. John, if you happen to read this, I hope you're well and living life to the fullest. This is not a case I had, but it was the case that made me decide to stay in law school. Sometime in my first year of law school, I went to see a criminal trial in action. Two young men had been arrested for shoplifting, a charge they pled guilty to. One of them was also accused of violence against official, basically assaulting someone in uniform who was performing their duties. It turns out the two men had been taken by security to separate rooms across a hallway while awaiting the police. The man accused of assault had heard his friend slash accomplice screaming in pain from the back other room. Security refused to let him see his friend or telling him what was happening. Fearing for his friend's safety, he bolted past the security guards and into the other room which required some pushing but caused no real harm, but led to him being violently restrained. The guards claimed that he tried to escape and that the friend was screaming for no reason. During the trial, the guard who held the friend was questioned and the defense attorney brought up the guard's record of using more violence than necessary, which he had done at least 10 times before. The attorney also brought up that the friend's arm had been fractured in two places due to the way the guard restrained him. The judge asked, how this was relevant to the client's case. And the attorney withdrew her argument instead of pointing out that her client had every reason to defend his friend. Our laws allow for what is essentially self-defense of others, but she was willing to let her client risk jail time instead of standing up for him. That's when I decided that if she could be a lawyer while failing to represent her client's interest, then I could finish law school and do a better job. Not a lawyer, but have a lawyer friend. He had a murder case that was so corrupt, he said he is considering quitting his work altogether. 
I don't remember exactly everything he told me, but I'll try to recount as much as I can. A man named David was convicted of stabbing a woman named Melissa to death, and he was on the defense for David. He told me that he was positive this man was framed for many reasons, and that likely it was Melissa's ex-husband that killed her. The first reason was there was no motive. David was a friend of a friend of Melissa's, but hadn't seen or spoken to her in years verified by phone and computer records. Next, the time frame didn't add up. David dropped his kids off at a birthday party, ran an errand, went to Walmart on security camera, then arrived back to pick up his kids from the party and go home. From the time he left dropping his kids off until the time he was seen at Walmart would have only given him minutes to knock on the door, there was no forced entry, get her to let him in, it was night and she hadn't seen him in years, and stab her multiple times without any noticeable blood on him, so he is able to immediately go to Walmart to pick up dinner, then directly to pick up his kids. Also, there was no DNA evidence recovered until his DNA was taken and the prosecution was allowed to examine the crime scene. It was later found the DNA he had provided had been tampered with and the prosecution was allowed in the lab, which I guess is unheard of in a murder case. Also, Melissa had been fleeing from her ex. He was a violent criminal and she had been saving his threatening voicemails and recordings, any calls, because she already made a police statement that she feared for her life. Also, the prosecution was calling witnesses to the defense and straight up threatening them if they spoke in court, so David didn't have a single witness to help his case. I know he told me more, and I wish I could articulate it as clearly as he had, but I simply can't remember everything. David was found guilty and is now serving time. I haven't talked to my lawyer friend since, but knowing him, I can imagine he still has his hands on the case in some way. If you want to read about it, look up David Russell Holbrook and Melissa Howard in Crestview, Florida. It's not going to mention any of the scandals, of course. They wanted it to be wrapped up as quickly as possible. Our justice system definitely does make murderers. Get a dash cam, people, and keep that shit on. Not a lawyer, but grew up with a prosecutor for a father. He tried many cases in his career from murder to narcotics. The event which stood out the most to him was he was looking into domestic violence laws. This was the early 1990s when many laws were being looked at and amended to protect victims. He went to a domestic violence anonymous meeting. There was a woman leading the meeting. Her husband was arrested for beating her so frequently the cops knew their address when it came over dispatch. He kept making bail or he'd only go for short stints to show up to begin the cycle again. There was only so much the police could do and restraining orders only have so much power. She had no protection. My dad spoke with her on several occasions and came to know her a little. During this meeting, she said if she didn't make it to the next, it was because she was dead. She didn't make it to the next meeting. The husband was later convicted of her murder. Though domestic violence laws have evolved and improved since then, there is still a long way to go. This story still has him rattled. Not a lawyer, paralegal. This was about eight years ago, and it's kind of what broke me. A man came in to get help to get emergency custody of his four-year-old daughter. I don't remember the exact specifics, but I don't believe he was on the birth certificate. Regardless, there was nothing on paper saying that he was the father and that he had any rights. He had to make medical decisions for this four-year-old little girl because she was laying in hospital in a coma. Mom was sitting in jail for beating her into a coma. I did as much as I could before handing him off the attorney. Then I went into the supply closet and cried. That case still haunts me. I left that particular job right after that. It was with a pro bono legal group slash pro se clinic. A law student here, but the Anu Singh case we learn about in our criminal law class. Australian law students planned for weeks and enlisted an accomplice to kill her boyfriend. The plan was to lace his coffee at a dinner party and then inject him with a lethal dose of heroin. Singh even told the people attending the party what her plan was. They do nothing. Joe, the boyfriend, is unconscious but alive post-injection. In the triple zero call, I heard it on YouTube if I remember correctly, you can hear her stalling, saying enough to seem normal, using shock as an excuse to take ages to get the address. If I remember correctly, Joe was still viably alive for hours after she administered the dose slash hours before the call. Ultimately, she succeeded. He died. She was charged but her defense was insanity slash substantial impairment by abnormality of mind. SIAM 
is a controversial defense in the Australian system. The case is so bizarre it reads like fiction. Very attractive law student kills boyfriend for no discernible reason, does it at a student dinner party after telling everyone she will, assisted by a woman who apparently was a bit enamored with her. Is she rational or is it all a farce? The reason why this case bothers me is, was she actually mentally ill slash impaired or was she incredibly clever? Did the legal system account for legitimate factors or was it fooled by a bright individual? Allegedly, she was taking high doses of IPCAC and had an eating disorder, was convinced she had a bizarre muscle-wasting disease, her family were concerned for her mental health, but she also allegedly bragged to people about how she was reading psych papers to fool the court system. Was she as unwell as her family thought, or was she sowing the seed of that perception knowing it was going to be her defense? She was convicted of manslaughter, lowered from murder because of mental illness slash SIAM, only served four years of a 10-year sentence, finished her degree inside. She's actually an academic, and several of my lectures know her. Some of them are too uncomfortable to talk about it. Another one makes jokes about how they'll never eat or drink near her. I read her dissertation slash a part of it because it was relevant to a class I was taking. It was, to be fair, well-written and pretty good. She writes about female offenders, which I suppose is appropriate. As a feminist, this case fascinates me. I can't help but wonder if she escaped true justice because we, as a patriarchal society, assume women often have no agency slash angel whore principle. At the time, she was a good-looking young woman and apparently charming. Were people more willing to excuse her because they assumed pretty women are angels? Compared to cases like Amanda Knox, a strange, awkward woman who was weirdly demonized, or Lindy Chamberlain, who was imprisoned despite likely innocence and was criticized for her perceived lack of emotion and the clothes she wore. The way the justice system treats alleged female killers is bizarre. Often you'll get side-eyed at my university by students for thinking Anu Singh wasn't insane, but a plain old psychopath. I've had people tell me I'm anti-feminist for thinking so, but all I see in her case is cold, planned detachment. I think she was very much in control of her faculties, but that's just my personal opinion. This is the kind of case that really makes you wonder if the criminal law system is remotely good at doing its job. There's a famous, in Australia, book on the case, Joe Sink's Consolation. I believe it's also been made into a film. In my whole career, I've only really messed up once, at least in a way that had a dispositive and negative effect on the case. Knock on wood, right? I was expecting a bar complaint or something afterwards, especially since my last meeting with the client did not go well, but I never heard from the client again. The case definitely kept me awake at night though, and I constantly worried about it. Well, eventually I googled my client just to see what he was up to, and the answer was prison. Apparently, he sexually assaulted a minor, and he'll be in prison for a very long time. Edit. And just to preclude any questions, my screw-up was a small procedural rule that the admin judge used to dismiss the proceedings. I'd never had a judge require a small rule before, so young attorney me hadn't heard about it, but it was clearly in the regulations, just super hidden. 